Um, I'm, this is an ecological economics conference, so most of you are pretty familiar with why, why we're all here and why we're motivated to be here. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the historic perspective that John referenced in his earlier discussion, um, which is w when you look at ecological economics, um, it arose out of a concern that mainstream economics um, was not reflecting and building upon the foundations of natural science and in parallel a concern that, that that disregard for things like limits to growth and resource constraints was setting us on a, on a dangerous trajectory. So um, that, that, that vision is not only a reflection of a failure to incorporate the kind of, let's call it objective lessons of physical sciences, but also this normative vision or normative view that we need to actually write or change the trajectory that we are, we are going on as a civilization. And so I think we would all agree here, um, and, and many people would agree now in civil society, that the concern that ecological economics uh, raised back in the 60s and 70s for the trajectory of human, human civilization um, is pretty well borne out by the lessons we keep reading in the newspapers. Um, and so, given that, I'm not going to belabor the discussion about the scientific um, arguments for why ecological economics as a worldview is, is valid. I really want to talk about the normative um, vision of ecological economics. So, st going way back um, to Herman Daly and, and even before, um, ecological economics acknowledged that you can't divorce um, a, a discipline like economics that's intended to uh, provide a path forward or provide an understanding of how we sustain ourselves from normative, normative questions. And uh, ecological economics as a theory has recognized that uh, economics is fundamentally a normative discipline and that it really is about not only simply the means that we use to meet our needs and our ends, but it actually really is a question of ends and you can't divorce questions of distributive justice, um, questions of what's a need versus what's a want from um, the fundamental components of of economics. And so I use here, this is the ends mean spectrum. It's hard not to point to something here in a small room, but this is the ends mean spectrum that Herman Daly put together. And he really recognized that um, when we talk about things like political economy, we're working at this level of intermediate means and intermediate ends. How can we efficiently meet our ends uh, using the resources available? And that we also need to extend this perspective out to look at things like ultimate ends. Um, which is why are we here, what's the purpose of society, what is an economy for, as well as things like ultimate means, which is in the ecological economics worldview, kind of low, low entropy matter energy. So this, this recognition from the early days in ecological economics that um, normative concerns are important and are an integral part of economics um, has, has been uh, critical in distinguishing ecological economics from mainstream economics. But I would say that while there was a, there's been a rec recognition for a long time, um, ecological economics has not been very good as a discipline in really um, elaborating this uh, values-based or this normative component of, of its theory. And this is, uh, we heard a lot before about how the normative disciplines are divorced from their scientific foundations. And what I'm going to argue a little bit here is that ecological economics, in a way, has divorced itself from a lot of the work, really interesting contemporary work in the 20th and 21st century in the other social sciences. Whether those are founded in science or not is, a, is an important uh, criteria for evaluating those contributions, but I think there's a lot that ecological economics could gain from a broader engagement with political science, sociology, and, and social theory. So if you look at um, ecologic, ecological economics normative program, its desire to transform the world to fit within what science tells us are our planetary boundaries, um, the question becomes how do we actually navigate on that path, how do we set these boundaries, and then how do we distribute the resources that we have. And this idea, this challenge of negotiating between biophysical limits and the constructed world around us. We heard from, from David Suzuki last night that we've built this whole economic and social edifice, and that's true, but in some ways we've built this complex edifice that has taken on a life of its own. And so one of the defining challenges for ecological economics is understanding how we can learn from science about what the constraints are on the way we live and organize ourselves, but then how we can actually devise and change paths to live within those constraints. And that begs the question of how we construct and understand what we value. And this is something that ecological economics has recognized, but has not necessarily um, been integrated into a broader and coherent social and political theory that, of how we actually 
develop new social norms and we actually enact those social norms and create institutions to organize ourselves to live within those limits. The second challenge is something that, you know, there's a lot has been made about the behavioral critique, this behavioral economics and psychology critique of economics. And that's been really powerful in understanding how individuals and small groups function. But there's a scale challenge. We now live within a globalized world. And the fact that we live within a globalized world means that some of the um, early social theories that have been clung to in ecological economics, ideas of communitarianism and things like that, while they're relevant, they really struggle to scale. And part of the, the value, I think, in reconnecting ecological economics to uh, disciplines such as political science is that it forces us to look at how we actually move in governance and in institutions and in interactions and in decision making from scale to scale, from that small scale individual choices to the choices of small groups to the choices of societies, cultures, nation states, and up to the globe. And the challenge with when, when we start talking about these um, moving from scales and start talking about values is we start running into conflicting value spheres and convicting understand, conv uh, conflicting understanding of what is valuable, what is important, and what is morally correct. And when we start dealing with these normative conflicts, we run into a fundamental challenge, which is ecological economics has made it clear from its earliest days that as a discipline, it is open to value pluralism. But the challenge with value pluralism is when you're trying to make decisions about collective, collective actions at a scale that transcends religions and cultures and languages, you start running into these collective action problems and this challenge of clashing values. And this is something that I think as a field ecological economics has, I would argue, devoted less time to than is really relevant. Because if you want to scale up from successes that we can, we can build within a single culture or within a, a multicultural cosmopolitan society up to something that will work at the global scale, we have to actually understand and have a theoretical means for arguing, debating, and adjudicating between conflicting views of what is valuable and what is normative and important. So with that, I want to talk about um, some ideas on how this could actually happen. And I think ecological economics, if you look at the literature, pe uh, writers within the discipline have, have embraced social theories that could be called modern, critically modern, uncritically modern, even postmodern. And this um, inconsistency has led to, uh, I, I think arises from a fundamental um, failure to really dig deep into the the roots and the theoretical underpinnings of the theories and the, pra and the practices that are being advocated. And I would suggest that if you look at the history of social theory and of political theory over the past 100 years, one of the underpinning, uh, one of the, the linchpins of this history is this idea of instrumental rationality. And instrumental rationality lies at the heart of what John and others argued earlier, which is this, this ability, th this rise of economic thinking that focuses on growth, growth, growth as a means, and that growth as a means has become an end in itself. And sociology, social history, critical theory, et cetera, have done a great job in, in terms of diagnosing this crisis within, within contemporary society. And there has been, and it's led to these kind of two parallel visions. One is that we're doomed to this rational, technocratic world where um, we can only focus on growing, we can only focus on administering according to instrumental, instrumentally rational principles, and that this is a doomed path because we're stuck in this modern worldview. And that's a little bit what Peter um, Brown earlier spoke about when he quoted from Horkheimer and Adorno in their Dialectic of Enlightenment. The other view is that um, we are in this postmodern world where we can't really uh, anchor any value-based discussions. Value-based discussions have no, no ability to compete with each other because they're masks for power. And we're stuck in this warring, warring situation of values. I don't think either of these, these kind of dominant critical theory, or these dominant theories have much value or relevance for, for ecological economics because ecological economics refuses to accept that there is no truth. It is not postmodern, and ecological economics also refuses to accept that the path we are on, this uncritically modern path, is acceptable. And there's a third, third way, there's a third path that has been proposed in the, in the literature, and that is um, this idea of deliberative democracy and deliberative democratic theory. And what, what makes this compelling is it's a way, the, the arguments behind deliberative democratic theory suggest that you can, if conditions are met and conditions are right, you can actually have rational or reasonable discussion about 
conflicting values and that people can come, to, uh, come together and agree on, con on where value conflicts exist, which values can be legitimate, and as a basis, establish norms and establish guidelines for society. This is a um, somewhat of a utopian project, but I think it's quite, quite important. And there are a number of different strands within the deliberative democracy world that of the work of Habermas, of Bowman, of Rawls, et cetera. And I think these are all rich potential social theory areas for ecological economics to explore as a potential uh, theoretical anchor for some of its um, deliberation about values. So I'll talk really, really quickly now about um, one strand, which is that of communicative action and the work of Habermas. So Habermas, um, his basic insight was to say that, well, it's true when in the Enlightenment we rejected the authority of kings and the authority of gods as a source of, of shaping our behavior, and we agreed that we as, as humans could create our own rules and our own boundaries, that what came out of this was this um, crisis where when you did want, when, when the institutions that humans created led us in the wrong path, we had no ability to say, well, this is a, a morally incorrect path, and, and appeals to morals no longer became legitimate. What Habermas recognized, though, is that humans can actually create truth amongst each other, and that this process of creating intersubjective truth through communication, when, when two individuals who have constructed their own worldviews enter into conversation, they try to do so as a means for actually achieving understanding, and that by um, entering into this communicative practice, they basically say that we want to understand each other, we want to understand each other from our different intersubjective perspectives, or our different subjective perspectives, but create an intersubjective truth that we can actually use as a basis for action. And this insight suggests that we are not stuck in this trap where we can't actually have values-based discussions. And this, I think, is critical for ecological economics to recognize and potentially to embrace as a social theory. So I put this quote up by Marx that you know, reason has always existed, but not always in reasonable form. And this, I think, it, it was long before the debates that Max Weber and Horkheimer, Adorno, Habermas, this whole German philosophical tradition had about rationality and instrumental versus value-based rationality. But this is important because we, we as ecological economists, economists feel compelled in many ways when we want to say that something should be a certain way we say, well, look, this is, this is bad, and then we try to appeal not on the basis of some moral belief that nature is important and should be protected, but we're constantly reframing and, and appealing to things like, um, oh, well, if we preserve this nature, it will provide water purification services or it will provide ecosystem services. This constant appeal to instrumental rationality to justify values is because reason alone is, as we've construed it in instrumental rationality, is simply that one, something will achieve our objectives. It requires a, uh, an object that we are trying to actually achieve. Reasonableness says that what you're trying to achieve is actually something that's worthwhile for us as society. And you can't, I mean, to paraphrase Rawls, a reasonable agent is one who has a view of where they want to go, but does not have the ability to necessarily justify in instrumental terms what they want to achieve. A rational agent knows that their means for achieving something is good, but has no means to recognize or understand that there may be different ends. And ecological economics essentially demands a social theory that combines reasonable, reasonableness with reason or, or, or traditional rationality. So with that, I want to just end um, quickly by saying, okay, if we accept that that we need to create this, de that, that a deliberative um, foundation or social theory is a social theory that could work within ecological economics. It begs the question, well, how do we actually reshape economics to achieve the conditions that would allow for that deliberative world to achieve, to, to occur? And I think, I think there's a lot to be found in, you know, there's been work in GPI and in energy return on investment and in other metrics that ecological economics have put forward to say, this could be a better measure of where society needs to go. Well, I think that what we, if we accept that d a deliberative democratic process is the only means by which we can actually argue and share competing visions about where we want to go, and that economics is fundamentally a means for helping us achieve that vision of where we want to go, we need to understand what economics needs to provide as basic conditions to enable us to actually 
have that debate in a, me in a way that enables us to have a debate that we can then agree on where we're going and then get there. And so I think an important body of work to also consider in ecological economics is that the work of um, Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. Their capabilities approach, in a way, outlines the bare prerequisites um, that we as a society should strive for. Nussbaum more than Sen. Sen never kind of came up with a list of the basic things that we need. Nussbaum has. But the importance of both Sen and Nussbaum's vision is that their vision of the economy is that the economy is the means by which we provide the capability for individuals to lead a life that they have reason to want to lead. So that says two things. One, you have to reason about your life. But two, you have to have that the goal of society and the economic system is to provide those capabilities. So why I think this is important and to connect this all together is that if we can conceive of an economy that focuses on providing the capabilities needed to reasonably live a life that we can reasonably justify, we are in a way developing an economic system that has the ability to create the preconditions for a deliberative demo democratic society. So with that, I want to conclude um, with some final comments on the implications of all of this for ecological economics. And I'm trying to share a lot of different strands and ideas of social theory, so I welcome the discussion afterward if I've glossed over any things. But I think that ecological economics as a discipline needs to recognize that um, to be able to actually scale up from these small groups of like-minded thinkers talking about where we think society should go, and to be able to scale up from that small group of like-minded thinkers to a model and a platform that actually enables us to engage with the rest of the world and to engage with societies and peoples and others that have very different concepts of what is valuable and important, we need to, recon we need to first recon reconceive of what the point of the economy is. And I think both Sen and Nussbaum provide a model that has a universal basis, but that actually um, still creates quite, a, quite room for theology, quite room for different sense of what is valuable and important, but suggests that economics as a system has to actually provide the basic material and political conditions to enable people to even have a debate about what is important. And then secondly, once, we, once we've actually conceived of economics as having this purpose of creating the preconditions for debate about what is important to us, we need to actually encourage and facilitate that debate. And we need to build debil deliberative processes into all of the institutions that we construct to realize this ecological economy. So with that, I want to uh, close with just some references and acknowledgement and then welcome Jeff to talk about uh, jurisprudence and law. So thank you.